Uh, good afternoon. Uh, once, uh, thanks for the organizers giving me this opportunity. And after that uh, colorful talk by Dr. Gulati, it is a bit of going retro. It is a maybe minus a, like a black and white movie. We'll see what I can do in the next 15 minutes. So intravascular imaging, whether you use IVAS or OCT, they provide additional information that supplement your angiography in improving the procedural outcomes. So where do you need this additional, where do you need this additional information? These are the areas you need this additional information in the assessment of intermediate coronary stenosis, evaluation of ambiguous lesion morphology, decision making on lesion preparation, stent sizing, stent optimization, and finally evaluation of stent failure. We shall start with the uh, uh, assessment of intermediate lesion significance. In the non-LMCA territory, the IVAS cutoff, amelia cutoff values varies between 1.9 millimeter square to 4 millimeter square among different studies. There's a poor correlation between IVAS MLA and FFR with, a low over, with a very low overall accuracy to be a good diagnostic test. Hence, IVAS should not be used in the diagnosis of flow limiting disease in the non-LMCA territory. In contrast, in the LMCA territory, the correlation between IVAS, and IVAS MLA and FFR is excellent. So you can use IVAS in the diagnosis of flow limiting disease in LMCA territory, particularly in the presence of downstream disease where FFR has little fallacies. The second important role is evaluation of uh, ambiguous lesion morphology. Observe these three lesions in the left mine. They all appear hazy and similar looking angiographically. If you see on IVAS, first one is a calcified nodule. The second one is a thrombus, and the third one is a ruptured plaque. They all need different type of treatment strategies. Uh, moving to the next area, and I was identified different plaque morphologies, which determine the need for lesion preparation. When the lesion is mainly fibrous, it needs preparation with semi-compliant or non-compliant balloon dilatation. If the lesion is fibrocalcific, it needs some form of lesion modification, either with cutting balloon or rotational atherectomy. When the lesion mainly consists of a soft plaque, it is, uh, it is better to go with a direct stenting strategy. And <coughs> moving to the next area, IVAS assessment of plaque morphology and its relation to the peripheral cell MI. There are different IVAS related morphologies that are associated with the nori flow. The first and important one is your attenuated plaque. Attenuated plaque is nothing but uh, uh, intra plaque attenuation in the absence of calcified plaque. The second one is presence of intra plaque echolucency. The third one is virtual histology thin cap fibrotheroma. And the fourth one is presence of thrombus. There is a study from uh, Japan. Uh, involving 200 ACS patients, when the attenuated block length is more than or equal to 5 millimeter in length, and uh, a distal protection strategy with a filter has been associated with uh, lower incidence of no reflow phenomena and improved corrected TME frame count. And uh, how do you size your stent? The stent sizing is based on the mean, mean distal reference vessel diameter. The mean distal reference vessel diameter. Both lumen-based and external elastic membrane-based strategies have been shown to be safe and efficacious. And in case of lumen diameter, the stent is upsized to the nearest 0.25 millimeter. In case if you use external elastic membrane diameter, it is downsized to the nearest 0.25 millimeter st uh, stent size. And what is the length of the stand? That is nothing but a distance between the reference segments. And an ideal landing zone is the one which is free of disease. However, if you have a diffuse disease, you have to identify a place with a block burden of less than 50% and the absence of a lipid rich tissue. So this is your ideal landing zone. So what is an optimally implanted stent? An optimally implanted stent is the one with a minimum stent area of more than 5.5 square millimeters or more than 80% of the average reference lumen area with uh, no molar position with an axial distance of more than 0.4 millimeter and more than one millimeter in length and no extensive tissue protrusion and with no dissection with more than 60 degree arc or flap extending beyond the endema or more than two millimeter length are associated with the hematoma and the landing zone block burden less than 50 percent and no lipid rich block at the edges. If you achieve all these parameters, your maze event is in the range of 1.5 percent. And we shall move on to the 
individual species, uh, lesion subsets. Uh. So starting with the left mine, in left mine disease, as we already mentioned, IVS evaluation has a good correlation with FFR, so it can be used for assessment of intermediate lesion uh, lesions in left mine. When your lumen area is less than 4.5 millimeter square, a revascularization strategy is indicated. If it is more than or equal to 6 millimeter square, revascularization can be safely deferred. When it is in between, that is 4.5 to 6 millimeter square, then we have to take into account another things. Suppose if you don't have a downstream disease, you can use either an FFR or a non-invasive stress test. If you have a downstream disease, you have to take cons into consideration the body size and age of the patient, plaque burden and removal modeling in the decision making for revascularization. And when you have an osteo left mine disease, uh, IVS helps in differentiating between constrictive remodeling where there is narrowing without a plaque or the present uh, narrowing due to atherosclerosis. And when we have a soft disease, IVS uh, identified a plaque distribution, either it is extending to the osteum or literally that designs how much left mine you have to stand or whether you have to use the left mine alone or crossover standing strategy. In case of distal left mine stenting, the plaque burden of more than 56% and MLA of less than 3.7 millimeter square predict a two stent strategy rather than a single stent crossover strategy. When you implant two stents, you have to aim for an following areas in different locations. It is 5 millimeter square in the LCX osteum, 6 millimeter square in LAD, and 7 millimeter square in polygon of confluence, and 8 millimeter square in the proximal. Uh, proximal to the polygon of confluence in the distal left mine. So these are the areas to achieve good long-term results. This you should remember that these are the minimum areas you are taking for. If you get a bigger the area, better will be your outcomes. What about bifurcation disease? There are four areas I can, IVS can help you in bifurcation disease intervention. The first one is to determine between the main branch disease versus true osteal disease in case of angiographic side branch narrowing like this. So IVS can clearly tell you whether the disease will involves only the main branch or it also involves the side branch. And the second one, if you are planning for a crossover stenting strategy, presence of a spiky carina and a large, sorry, Large plaque burden opposite to the carina it high predicts a high incidence of a side branch compromise post crossover stenting. And as in left mine disease, an MLA of side branch MLA of less than 2.4 millimeter square, plaque burden of more than 51%, and the POC area of less than 3.7 millimeter square predicts a two stent strategy rather than a single stent strategy. When you implanted your stent, I was uh, clarifies the position of the wire crossing either the proximal or distal cell. So these are the four areas I was can help you during bifurcation intervention. What about calcified lesion interventions? I was helping, I was helps in three areas. One is selecting a debulking strategy based on the arc of the uh, calcium. When it is less than 180, you have to go for a balloon-based strategy. When it is more than 180, you have to go for an atherectomy strategy. And once uh, the strategy is decided and the dilatation and atherectomy has been done, it confirms the fracture in the calcium or dissection in the other parts of the vessel, so which predicts a good extent expansion. Once the stent is implanted, it uh, helps in optimizing your stent results. So this is the second example here. This lesion, 360 degree calcium, was resistant to balloon dilatation. An atherectomy was undone, and balloon dilatation induced a fracture here. So that uh, this is post stent implantation. This fracture allowed a full expansion of the stent. So I was helps in optimizing your stent following stent implantation. And what about chronic total occlusion? During anti-grade CT or PCA, in case you have a blunt occlusion with a suitable side branch, the side branch IVAS helps in identifying where exactly you had to penetrate in the proximal cap. And in the secondly, when the anti-grade wire fails, it independently enter into the subindimal space. And if you don't have a retrograde option, then IVAS can be used as a last bailout strategy to guide wire, your wire back into the intimal plaque and into the distal true lumen. And uh, in retrograde, retrograde strategy, we all know the commonest mode of uh, revascularization is reverse cut. And when both the wires are in the same space, it is very easy to connect uh, uh, spaces and uh, successful reverse cut. When the wires are in different spaces, uh, and it is very, very difficult to establish connections in the reverse cut. IOS tells you exactly where your wire position that helps you in redirecting wire into the same space and successful completion of reverse cut. And in addition, when you have uh, in the retrograde approach, when your plaque is at a major side branch, uh, when 
when the proximal cap is at a major side branch or or in the iota osteal location if you come or through the subintimal space you can it can result in inadvertent closure of your side branch or it can produce a major iota osteal dissection so by identifying the exact position of retrograde wire i i was helps in avoiding this major complication what about diffuse disease you need three information in diffuse disease one is what is the exact vessel size whether it is a true small vessel or it is a diffuse plaque burden the second is what is your ideal landing zone from where to where you have to extend your stent the third one is what is the extent of disease these are the three information you need in the presence of diffuse disease i was gives you all three informations once you selected an appropriate size stent and implanted again i was helps in you in confirming optimal stent expansion and uh, another important area a uh, application of iwas is pca guidance in patients with compromised renal function or contrast allergy where we use combination of a metallic solute created by multiple wires in side branches and along with iwas imaging it is it helps in uh, implanting your stent and optimizing without minimal or no contrast usage and finally assessment of stent failure we all know all the stent failure are result not resulting from the same mechanisms if you take early stent failure it is mainly related to procedural factors comparing to late stent failure which is related to neoatherosclerosis late acquired malposition or aneurysm formation stent fracture or uncovered stent shreds so these are the major causes of late stent failure by identifying these causes with iwas you can use a individualized uh, therapy imparted uh, for a patient with stent failure So, what is the evidence for IVAS in our routine practice? So, we start with the ADAPT DS study, the largest registry of 8,500 patients. IVAS usage was associated with reduction, uh, reduction in definite or probable stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, overall MACE events, and in the multivariate analysis, IVAS usage was associated with IVAS usage was an independent predictor of uh, MACE events. and uh, the when the follow up was extended to 2 years in addition to reduction in mace events definite or probable stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction i was to say also reduced clinically driven target vessel revascularization and in the sub analysis uh, i was benefit extended from complex lesion to simple pci and stemi and stemi unstable angina to stable coronary artery disease the entire spectrum it has shown beneficial effect of i was usage and uh, even though earlier studies were not earlier randomized studies were not adequately powered to show the hard incomes the recent three randomized studies have shown uh, beneficial outcomes with iwas guidance so this is the first study of ultimate study from china and 1500 1450 all comer patients randomized between iwas and angiography iwas utility iwas usage was associated with significantly lower incidence of target lesion failure and if you see that when you achieve optimal stent criteria your outcomes are in the 1.5 million 5 percent range and uh, in <coughs> in another randomized study involving cto lesions uh, i was usage has been associated with uh, reduction in the mace events reduction in the death or sorry the reduction of uh, composite of death or myocardial infarction and a numerically better target lesion revascularization in another study of long lesions i was expel study of 1400 patients i was usage has been associated with uh, overall decrease in the mace events and again you see here if you achieve the optimal i was implantation criteria your mace rate is in the range of 1% and uh, there are uh, there are multiple meta analyses there are overall eight meta analyses combining all the registries and randomized trials and the four meta analyses of ds uh, randomized control trials all have shown that uh, improvement in overall mace cardiovascular mortality myocardial infarction stent thrombosis and tlr tvr with uh, iwas usage in patients with ds implantation to summarize iwas provides additional information that supports coronary angiography supplements coronary angiography the various roles in cath lab range from intermediate lesion assessment to evaluation of stent failure i was improves outcomes both in simple and complex lesions both in stable and acute coronary syndromes and this justifies integration of iwas in our practice thank you thank you dr vijay i think now the uh, we can have few questions from the audience any comment please so uh, this was a great lecture and we all understand right as interventionists that iwas is a great tool so my question would be why is it not you know used as often as it should be i mean you in your 
minutes of lecture, we saw how it can improve our outcomes. And in the long term, that is good for our patients yeah. and it's good for us. So why aren't we using it as uh, often as we should be? Yeah, I think uh, this. Uh, two, three things say with its main limitation. One is the expertise and the second one is the availability of hardware. The third one is the cost, obviously, particularly in developing countries like ours. And the cost is, again, main issue. And I strongly feel maybe comfort, the operator should be comfortable in using the system and there should be at least some basic knowledge in interpreting images and uh, guiding your procedure. That may be a main limiting, uh, I feel, in our country. In our, in our part of the world, maybe as you pointed out, maybe we do not have the expertise, but one good thing uh, Tejas was pointing out from next year onwards, Trico is going to be more focused on complex <laughs> lesions and on imaging and on physiology. So maybe we can look forward to next year that we can learn more about IVERSI, more cases, more discussion and not only IVERS about OCT, FFR and the other tools that can help us optimize our outcomes. So, sir, would you like to comment on this as well? Yeah. I just want to ask, is there any study regarding laser stents, ultra thin stents and uh, post stent dilatation? I think the apposition of stents? Po post and dilatation, yeah. that was the original IVERS study by Columbo et al. has shown that uh, it has improved outcomes. That is how uh, this uh, warfarin has disappeared from the practice to dual antipolated therapy. And difference between... Uh, thin set, thick set, but thin set obviously is better. Studies have shown that, but I don't know any specific study evaluated. But maybe if you see that first generation, second generation sense, and that second generation sense are far better than first generation. We have an audience who wants to ask a question. No, we don't. Okay, that's the photographer. Sorry, I thought that was one of the audience. Oh, my mistake. So we don't okay. have any questions? Any more questions? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's one question. There's one question. You raised your hand, right? Yes. Please, come for. Is there any difference for the definition of power position depending on the thickness of the strut? Is it the same thing? Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
almost normal looking portion. It, it might be uh, better to avoid the uh, edgy stenosis, as he said. Yeah, and another thing is uh, the studies from Prati's group has shown that uh, when you have a plaque at the edges and your lumen area is less than 4 to 4.5 millimeter square, again it can result in uh, edgy stenosis. So bigger the lumen area at the landing zone and uh, disease free zone is the one you have to aim for. Now the next lecture is uh, by Dr. Mamas and Dr. Mam Mamas and Mamas. Does TRA uh, transradial angioplasty really affect femoral skills of an operator? I think this would be good. Uh, this one nowadays it is being said that uh, those who are doing radial sometimes they are forgetting uh, femoral and uh, this will uh, put a light whether this is really so or something different. So thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chairman. Uh, thank you to Tay Jas for inviting me for a great meeting. If there's any take-home message from this lecture, it is that radial does not compromise the femoral skills of an operator. So this is the UK experience. Before I start the lecture, just to say that today is International Go Red for Women Day. Uh, cardiovascular disease accounts for about 800,000 deaths of women in India. And so if you have a wife, girlfriend, or mother, and you don't know what their blood pressure and cholesterol is, then you should certainly encourage them to find out. Thank you for that. So back to the lecture. Um, the radial artery has become the default access site choice for PCI in many countries, including India. Several randomized controlled trials have shown the reduced risk of mortality associated with the transradial route in high-risk populations, and therefore um, transradial access site is the gold standard for PCI and is a class one indication for ACS by the European Cardiac Society. In the United Kingdom, um, radial access site has grown, and of this year, 87% of all PCIs are taken through the radial approach. There's differences in um, procedures in the United Kingdom. This is some data from our pa paper in circulation showing that um, some areas have not adopted radial as perhaps other areas have, particularly London. And we estimate that nationally adoption of radial has saved 450 lives. And uh, uh, our more recent paper has saved 15 million pounds. So radial saves lives, saves money. However, even in high volume radial centers, there are about 5 to 10% of situations where you may need to take a femoral approach. And there is a concern among some people that taking a femoral approach may lead to compromised outcomes in people that do predominantly radial. There is perhaps some evidence on the face of it, uh, which is one of these papers um, by uh, Jean Cleur, um, which is a single site comparison of access complications. Um, over two time periods, 96 and 98, and 2006 and 2008. And there was important characteristics differences between uh, the historical cohort and the contemporary cohort. So the contemporary cohort was much higher risk. They were older, uh, they were much more likely to be diabetic, uh, they had larger French sizes, they were more comorbid, um, they were more acute, um, that they had concomitant uh, femoral vein punctures. And so, unsurprisingly, in contemporary practice, these patients had worse uh, hematomas, worse retroperitoneal bleeds. It's not because um, radial operators are worse at doing femoral cases, it's because the cohort was more complex. And they tried to adjust for some confounders, and they suggested that these um, relationships remain. But again, you know, important confounders such as shock, French size, venous cannulation drugs were not adjusted for. So obviously, if you look at femoral outcomes in more complex patients in contemporary practice, you will see worse outcomes. That's not beyond the realm of reason. So a lot this, you know, this paper had a lot of press, and so we decided to look at it from the United Kingdom perspective. So we wanted to look and see whether a change in access site practice in the United Kingdom towards radial at the center level has led to worse femoral outcomes. And we also wanted to see whether the improved clinical outcomes achieved by radial access 
are attenuated by um, loss of femoral proficiency. And the paper was published in Circulation uh, car Cardiac Interventions um, two years ago. So what we did was look at all the centres in the United Kingdom, and in 2006 there were predominantly high femoral uh, centres. Now, a small proportion of them remained as femoral centres over time. The vast majority switched to radial, so they became low femoral proportion centres. And so what we wanted to do was compare the femoral outcomes of these centres that stayed predominantly femoral to those centres that changed to radial. So it was um, a big analysis. Um, we looked over a seven-year period. We only looked at femoral-only procedures at the centre level, and we looked at 30-day mortality and vascular complications. And we did complex statistical modelling, uh, where we adjusted for all sorts of uh, different uh, covariates and differences in characteristics. So in the United Kingdom, there's 92 centres. Over 230,000 femoral procedures were analysed. Each one of these boxes uh, represents a centre. What one of these things shows is the proportion of femoral cases. So if it's close to one, it means it's 100%. As it drops down, it means the centre's going radially. The darker the line, the higher the volume the centre is. So you can see all the centres that have remained femoral are very small, low-volume centres. The centres that have switched to femoral, the cases in the radial centres, are very different from the ones undertaken um, femorally in the femoral centres. They're much more complex, they're sicker patients, they're more likely to be cardiogenic shock, and so forth. They're more likely to have coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, they're more likely to be dialysed. Uh, they're more likely to use uh, glycoprotein 2b3 a inhibitors. So if you're in a radial centre and you're going femorally, that means your patient is much more complex than if you're in a femoral centre and choose to go femorally. And so if you look at unadjusted outcomes, as we did here, what you see is that over time, the femoral outcomes in the centres that have um, changed from radial to femoral have got worse. Now, that doesn't mean that the, fem the radial centres are getting worse at doing uh, femoral cases. It means that the cases they're doing are much more complex. Okay? So the worse outcomes, unadjusted, relate to complexity of diseases. So if you're in radial centre and you're doing a femoral case in contemporary practice, that means that case is really complex. That's why you're going femorally. Once you were adjust for these differences, and these are the factors that we adjusted for, so we adjusted for 30 different factors, so the indication, the age, the sex, procedural characteristics, we adjusted for institutional characteristics, you can see that the three centres' outcomes are exactly the same. So if you adjust for complexity differences, the femoral outcomes for mortality are the same over time. So for a centre that's gone for predominantly radial, there is no compromise of femoral outcomes over time. If you look at the top 10 radial centres, so these are the centres that do over 90% of their cases radially, and you look at the top 10 femoral centres that are almost exclusively femoral, and again, you do the same sort of thing. You adjust for differences in patient characteristics. Again, no difference in femoral outcomes. So going radially does not compromise your femoral outcomes. And remember, this is in a quarter of a million patients. This is the whole UK practice, not one centre. We also excluded cardiogenic shock patients and complex cases you know, to see if there was a difference. And again, centres that have switched um, from, radial, from femoral to radial, there's no compromise in outcomes. The lines are superimposable. When you look at vascular complications, I mean, there's an argument that perhaps mortality is um, not a good surrogate for femoral competency, so we should look at vascular complications. So again, we did the same sort of analysis with vascular complications. And you can see that in the centres that have changed um, from femoral to radial, even though the cases are much more complex, once you adjust for case mix, there is no difference in vascular complications between radial and femoral centres. So again, switching from femoral to radial does not compromise uh, your femoral outcomes in a radial centre. We um, 
analyze the analyze the data differently we looked at every PCI so every um, 250,000 PCIs and we looked at the femoral proportion in the 12 months preceding that particular case and we analyzed it that way as a continuous variable and we did that 250,000 times and you can see once you adjust for case complexity it's a straight line there is no relationship between going ra switching to radial at the center level and making your femoral outcomes worse. So I think, in conclusion, the poor ephemeral outcomes that have been observed in predominantly the high-volume radial centers are driven by the fact that these centers utilize the femoral approach in the highest-risk cases. So in my center, I mean, so we have um, 11 operators, 10 of the operators um, are over 95% uh, radial operators. And so the sorts of cases that I'll do femoral are the ones where the patient's in extremis, in cardiogenic shock, I can't feel radial access, the blood pressure's 50 or 60. You know, if you compare my femoral outcomes just from those cases compared to young, healthy, elective cases undertaken by femoral operators, obviously my outcome is going to be worse. Once you adjust for these differences, no difference in outcomes. I think in a country like the United Kingdom, where um, there's been a transition to predominantly radial first practice, there is no evidence to suggest worst femoral outcomes in radial centers. And so it is my view, and um, I think we can show that very robustly in national data, that the radial access should remain the default procedure because it has a mortality benefit and a health economic benefit and it does not impact on femoral outcomes. Thank you.